I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. Welcome to this podcast of The People's Pharmacy. You can find previous podcasts and more information on a range of health topics at peoplespharmacy.com. The Hippocratic Oath is often reduced to the phrase, first, do no harm. Yet every drug ad lists many scary side effects. This is The People's Pharmacy with Terry and Joe Graydon. Our guest is Dr. Rochelle Bookbinder, a distinguished physician and researcher in Melbourne, Australia. Her book is titled Hypocrisy, How Doctors Are Betraying Their Oath. Has the pharmaceutical industry overhyped its products in television commercials? Are the benefits overstated and risks downplayed? How can patients defend themselves from a system that has seemingly forgotten the old phrase, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure? Coming up on The People's Pharmacy, from Hippocrates to Hypocrisy, the hidden risks of health care. In The People's Pharmacy Health Headlines, could eggs be good for the brain? Eggs are high in cholesterol, so for years, Americans have been cautioned to moderate their consumption. On the other hand, eggs also provide certain nutrients, such as choline, that are beneficial for the brain. An analysis of data from nearly 900 older adults suggests that egg consumption helps women remember words better. These volunteers entered the Rancho Bernardo study between 1988 and 1991. They also answered detailed dietary questionnaires and took cognitive tests. About four years passed between their entry into the study and their second round of mental assessment. Women who ate more eggs did slightly better on a part of the test called category fluency. The researchers conclude that egg consumption does not have detrimental effects and may even have a role in the maintenance of cognitive function. Ever since the Olmecs of Mesoamerica discovered cacao and created a spicy beverage, humans have been entranced with this natural product. It's the foundation of modern-day chocolate. Investigators continue to learn about the health benefits of cocoa flavanols. The latest research comes from a British study published in the journal Food and Function. This randomized, counterbalanced, double-blinded, crossover, postprandial intervention study examined the impact of a high flavanol beverage on vascular function. The young healthy volunteers had to consume a high-fat meal consisting of two butter croissants with 10 grams of salted butter, one and a half slices of cheddar cheese, and eight and a half ounces of whole milk containing either a high-flavanol cocoa or low-flavanol cocoa powder. After an hour and a half, the subjects completed an eight-minute mental stress test. It involved a mathematical task that kept increasing in speed, accompanied by a loud, aversive buzzer after an incorrect response and after every 10 answers. The stress test produced increases in heart rate and blood pressure. The fatty foods reduced blood vessel function that lasted for about an hour and a half after the meal. But the high flavanol cocoa beverage actually mitigated the decline in vascular function. The authors conclude that flavonoid rich foods have the potential to acutely protect endothelial function against poor food choices, such as high fat snacks, during episodes of stress in young healthy adults. People who experience a blood clot in their legs or lungs are often prescribed anticoagulant medications. A new study from Denmark shows that if they also take a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, such as ibuprofen, diclofenac, or naproxen, they're at increased risk for bleeding. This can occur in many different organs, the digestive tract, the brain, and the urinary tract. Because such drugs are so widely available by prescription and over-the-counter, Patients on anticoagulants should be warned about this interaction. Lots of us spend our days sitting and staring at screens. A new study utilizing data from the UK Biobank has found that 10 hours a day of sitting increases the risk for heart failure. The researchers recruited nearly 90,000 middle-aged volunteers who wore an accelerometer for a week. 
that gave exact details on how much time they spent sitting and how much they moved around. After eight years, roughly 3,600 participants had developed atrial fibrillation. 1,850 had heart failure, and more than 1,600 had experienced a heart attack. For heart attacks and atrial fibrillation, the more time spent sitting, the higher the risk. For heart failure, though, the picture was different. At about 10 and a half hours of sitting a day, the risk of heart failure rose quite markedly. Extra exercise offered some protection from heart attacks, but not from heart failure. According to one author, future guidelines and public health efforts should stress the importance of cutting down on sedentary time. An accompanying editorial noted, replacing just 30 minutes of excessive sitting time with any type of physical activity can lower heart health risks. And that's the health news from the People's Pharmacy this week. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy. I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. Historically, medical students took the Hippocratic Oath at graduation. It traditionally contains a promise not to harm a patient. Many medical schools have abandoned this practice, in part because it's very hard to keep that promise. Modern medicine is set up so that getting care often involves some collateral damage. To learn more about this challenge, we're talking with Professor Rochelle Bookbinder. She holds the position of Senior Principal Research Fellow with Australia's National Health and Medical Research Council. She's the head of the Musculoskeletal Health and Wiser Healthcare Units in the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine at Monash University in Melbourne. Dr. Bookbinder is the author with Dr. Ian Harris of Hypocrisy, How Doctors Are Betraying Their Oath. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy, Dr. Rochelle Bookbinder. Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm looking forward to talking to you both. Dr. Bookbinder, we love your book and we love the title, Hypocrisy. But it's not spelled the way most people think of it. It's spelled H-I-P-P-O-C-R-A-S-Y. Why did you choose that title for this important work? So th that, that title is a, a play on words. And the Hippocratic Oath, which is spelled H-I-P-P-O-C-R-A-T-I-C, oath, the pledges in that oath are perfect for what we wanted to discuss in the book. And so the, the book is written with each chapter being a pledge in the Hippocratic Oath, which most doctors uh, around the world might take when they graduate medicine. The, the first chapter is called First Do No Harm, which has been attributed to Hippocrates, but actually isn't in the Hippocratic Oath, but it, we thought it was such an important first pledge that we put it there as well. Well, you know, what's so interesting about the Hippocratic Oath, and we've done a fair amount of research about it, because as you point out, most graduating medical student classes around the world do, in essence, take that oath, although it's been sort of disappearing gradually, unfortunately. But the essence of it, this idea, the concept, first do no harm, seems so critical. And it was worded, like I said, a little bit differently by Hippocrates, but the message was still there. What went wrong? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the Hippocratic Oath has been about, you know, around for centuries, and the messages are really simple. First, do no harm. Uh, don't treat people who are normal. Don't make up diseases. Make sure that what you're doing has benefit uh, and the benefit outweighs the harm. So I don't really understand what went wrong, except that in recent times, we've been much better at looking at the evidence for what we do. And it's only really been since the advent of epidemiology and then clinical epidemiology, which is really the basic science of medicine, that we've been able to study what we do and understand that many of the things that we do don't actually benefit the patient. 
Uh, and I think the general public often think that everything we do is grounded in evidence and facts. Uh, but if you just start looking back and see, well, why do we do it this way? We can find many instances where the evidence doesn't exist. And this became clear to me when I studied clin clinical epidemiology. We were told to go and find a, a, a treatment and look at what the evidence was that it worked. And I actually looked at something called hydroxychloroquine for systemic lupus erythematosus. And the whole basis for treating everybody with lupus with this drug was based on an expert's book where he described several cases of people who'd been taking the drug and they seemed to not have flares of their disease. And that was the total basis of why we did that for many years. So you're telling us that there was no huge randomized controlled trial of patients with lupus. Some of them took hydroxychloroquine and some of them did not? No, there has never been a trial like that. When it was realized that it, there had been no trial, people thought it was too late to do that trial that you mentioned. So they actually did do a trial, but it was a little bit different. They didn't think it was ethical to do that trial and not put people on the drug. So what they did was randomize people who were stable on the drug with lupus and randomized half of them to stop the drug and the other half to continue with the drug. And what they found was, was that people who stopped the drug actually then started having more flares. So that's how they finally proved it. But that is such an example of something that I thought when I trained as a rheumatologist was was based on high certainty evidence, but it wasn't. Uh, it seemed like a good idea. And in this instance, it was a good idea. But the more you study things that are already in standard practice, the more you realize that many of the things we do, particularly in my field, don't actually work. Well, in fact, Dr. Bookbinder, you and your um, co-author, Dr. Ian Harris, have written in Hypocrisy that maybe as much as a third of what doctors do in medicine is not particularly beneficial to the patient, and perhaps 10% is actually harmful, and that you have direct evidence of that. Can you tell us about that evidence? Sure. So there are many, many examples. One example that we use in the book is knee arthroscopy, which is used for people with knee pain due to osteoarthritis. Uh, and osteoarthritis can involve um, changes in the, in the joint itself or in the cartilage or menisci. And so people for, for decades have been cleaning out the joint, trimming torn cartilages and saying that this is a treatment for osteoarthritis and it would delay the need for a joint replacement down the track, just like sweeping the kitchen floor. You know, you clean it up and then it will last a bit longer. But in fact, when the trials were done, comparing a real arthroscopy to a pretend arthroscopy where they still made the cut and they looked inside the knee, but they didn't actually do anything, it found that it actually didn't result in any benefit to the patient. And uh, the first trial wasn't believed and it took many more trials of exactly the same sort of placebo controlled trial to show that it actually made no difference. What we found recently when we reviewed the evidence, and some of the trials have now um, had longer-term follow-up, and we found that it actually probably causes more osteoarthritis, and instead of delaying the joint replacement, it actually brings it forward. Well, that brings me to an area that fascinates me, because as a pharmacologist, of course, I'm always interested in medications. And for decades, right to this day, your specialty, but many other physicians as well, inject corticosteroids into joints, whether it's the knee or whether it's the hip or whether it's the shoulder. And I'm a tennis player. And so a lot of the people that I play tennis with will talk about getting a steroid shot. And they say, well, it, it makes me feel better for a couple of weeks, maybe even a month or three. But then it 
goes away. And one of the um, physicians we've interviewed in the past, Dr. Norton Hadler, told us many years ago, oh yeah, corticosteroids, they melt bones. Which is, of course, an exaggeration. But what's the deal on steroid shots? Okay, so firstly, I know Norton Hadler well, and I have to disagree with him on this one. Corticosteroids are powerful anti-inflammatories. So think about when you take an anti-inflammatory tablet, you don't expect that to last long term. You know the mode of action is short, and there are ones that might last 24 hours. Corticosteroids are more powerful than just simple uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. But all studies have, have shown that they tend to last four to six weeks if they're going to work, and we wouldn't expect a benefit beyond there. So I think the problem is a misunderstanding about what corticosteroid is and, and how it should be used. So I would use it for people with a, a, more acute symptoms where they have more inflammatory symptoms like night pain, stiffness, um, and I would not use that for mechanical pain. So pain, you know, when you hit the ball, um, that's more chronic. Uh, so we've done several trials now. It's one of the few things that we found that actually does work. But what drives me mad is that people, there are many trials out now that compare it to other treatments and look at the outcome at one year and say, oh, you know, it's better than steroid. But steroid, the effect of steroid leaves the body in four to six weeks. So why are we looking at one year? And, and, and that's really, again, a misunderstanding about your area on um, pharmacology and how drugs work. But I think part of the point that uh, Dr. Hadler was trying to make is that steroids used um, time and again are going to have some negative effects that doctors and patients may not be taking into account. So the only effects, a detrimental effects that have been really, I guess, proven in a way, is that having a steroid injection very close to having a joint replacement does increase the risk of perioperative infection. Um, but I'm not aware of any long-term studies that, that have shown that that there are detrimental effects of steroid. Of course, we wouldn't keep doing the injections. And can I just say one thing, that, that if it's not working after one injection, there's no point repeating it. And if it's not working, you know, so, so most people won't need repeat injections because it either works or it doesn't work. You're listening to Dr. Rochelle Bookbinder, professor at Monash University School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine. Dr. Bookbinder is coordinating editor of the Cochrane Collaboration Musculoskeletal Back and Neck Division. Her book, co-authored with Dr. Ian Harris, is Hypocrisy, How Doctors Are Betraying Their Oath. When we return, we'll find out why doctors offer such widely different advice. Dr. Bookbinder will tell us about the Cochrane Collaboration as a way of getting at objective evidence on healthcare interventions. You'll also hear about the pros and cons of statins and osteoporosis drugs. You're listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon. This podcast is made possible in part by Cocovia, maker of the most proven and concentrated flavanol extract in the market today, Coco Pro Coco Extract. If you're not already familiar with the benefits of coco flavanols, now is a better time than ever to consider adding Cocovia supplements to your daily health routine. From November 25th to December 5th, get 30% off all Cocovia products using the discount code BFCM2024 at Cocovia.com. That stands for Black Friday, Cyber Monday, 2024. BFCM2024 is the code to use. Whether you're focused on supporting your heart or brain health, Cocovia has a supplement to meet your needs. Each Cocovia product contains Cocopro, 
the number one bioactive flavanol extract backed by over 20 years of research. These potent nutrients are clinically shown to promote cardiovascular health and boost cognitive function as you age. You can choose from easy-to-take capsules or a tasty dark chocolate flavor powder. Be sure to take advantage of their best deal of the year. It's an opportunity you won't want to miss. That discount code again, BFCM. That stands for Black Friday, Cyber Monday, BFCM 2024. That time frame, November 25th to December 5th. 30% off all Cocovia products. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy. I'm Terry Graydon. And I'm Joe Graydon. The People's Pharmacy is made possible in part by Coco Via Dietary Supplements. Coco Via's biggest sale of the year is Black Friday and Cyber Monday. You could promote your heart and brain health by incorporating cocoa flavanols into your daily routine for optimal cardiovascular and cognitive support. More information at cocovia.com. Today, we're talking about the hidden risks of healthcare. How do doctors determine what works and what doesn't? How can patients evaluate the risks and benefits of a medication or other intervention? How good are statins at preventing heart attacks and saving lives? Our guest is Dr. Rochelle Bookbinder, head of the Musculoskeletal Health and Wiser Healthcare Units at Monash University School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine. Dr. Bookbinder is coordinating editor of the Cochrane Musculoskeletal Back and Neck Division and participates in the Clinical Trials Network Center of Research Excellence. Her book, co-authored with Dr. Ian Harris, is Hypocrisy, How Doctors Are Betraying Their Oath. Dr. Bookbinder, a lot of people think that if a doctor recommends an approach, whether it's a pill or or surgery or even just a lifestyle approach, that it must be right, that it must be based on evidence and that they should follow their doctor's advice. And of course, we, we always tell people to follow their doctor's advice. How come doctors can differ so widely in the advice they give? Well, I think that's a fundamental problem that we have in medicine and, and a lot of the helping professions is that we overestimate the benefits of what we do and we underestimate the harms. And there are often divergent opinions for many reasons. It could be that one doctor is evidence-based and is basing their advice on what the evidence says. Um, A second doctor might be basing their advice on their experience and not on the facts. Uh, And so that's one way of getting um, different advice. Of course, in our world of fee-for-service, there could be other reasons as well uh, that I won't won't verbalise. You serve on the Cochrane Collaboration, is that correct? Correct, yes. Can you tell us briefly what that is and why it's so important? Yes, so the Cochrane Collaboration was established um, in response to Archie Cochrane's quest that that all the evidence that we have should be summarized or synthesized in some way and be available to give doctors the most up-to-date evidence for a treatment or, or other type of thing like a diagnosis or a prognosis. And so the Cochrane Collaboration performs systematic reviews where they synthesize the best available evidence um, together to understand whether a treatment works or it doesn't work. Um, and whether it causes harms. Uh, and there are people all over the world, uh, many volunteers and, and consumers that can be part of the Cochrane Collaboration to, to develop these high quality systematic reviews. Unfortunately, there are now millions of systematic reviews and my golden rule is that if there are more reviews than there are trials, the treatment does not work. 
and and in outside of Cochrane, there are many reviews that are not ever that are not done correctly, and are done to um, justify the preconceived beliefs of the the authors. Within Cochrane reviews, what we found is that a very common conclusion, whatever the intervention is that's being looked at, is that the evidence is of poor quality, and therefore it's impossible to conclude whether it works or not. Uh, That's something we've frequently seen, which means that we need better research, no? Absolutely. We we definitely need um, better research, uh, and there is a lot of waste in the current research that we do. People are not asking the most important questions or the questions that will change uh, outcomes for the better for patients. Uh, and, And sometimes trials are being done, again, to prove something that perhaps might have been proven not to work because the believers want to show that it does work. So there is a lot of waste. Well, obviously, the pharmaceutical industry has a vested interest in convincing physicians and patients that their medications are highly effective. And something that you don't have in Australia are the um, direct-to-consumer prescription drug ads that are now ubiquitous on television in the United States. We understand that they also have such things in New Zealand, but we're the only two countries in the world that allow these kinds of commercials. And a lot of that information just has people having the best times of their life. They're playing with dogs and children and they're on the beach and it's beautiful and everybody's smiling. And then they talk about all these horrific side effects, but they say it very quickly and they're all these distracting visual images while they're saying it. And so as a result, I think most Americans believe that there's a pill for every ill And there's not a thing to worry about in terms of those awful side effects that they talk about, like heart attacks and strokes and cancer. And so they just ignore them. And unfortunately, this has become a mindset here. Is it any different in Australia where you don't have those commercials? Uh, I I guess, unfortunately, it's probably not as different. That's one of the reasons we wrote the book. We want people to be much more skeptical about the advice and I'm and you know doctors want to do the best thing for their patients but sometimes they're misled um, because they don't understand the evidence themselves and so it's just a matter of asking some questions you know what are the benefits of what you're proposing what are the harms what would happen if I did nothing what are the other options what are, what are the you know chances that you'll cure me um, what it, so there, there are all sorts of questions that that we need to ask in Australia, actually, can I say that there are many, um, every week, the, the TGA are finding um, direct-to-consumer advertising for uh, med- medical cannabis. Uh, and we know in Australia that about 61% of people are taking cannabis for chronic pain. Um, but we've done research, again, um, well-conducted systematic reviews to Cochrane standards to show that it actually does not work for chronic pain. So we have a problem in Australia as well. Now, you mentioned the TGA, but a lot of our listeners won't be familiar with the, that acronym. Can you explain TGA is? Is the Therapeutic Goods Administration, and it's sort of equivalent to your FDA. Thank you. Dr. Bookbinder, one of the things that I've found frustrating over the last 30, 40 years of looking into pharmaceuticals and both benefits and risks is it's very hard for people to understand how well a drug actually works. We've talked about the number needed to treat uh, many times on our show. We, we've talked about other ways for people to better understand, well, how well will this benefit me? If you need statistics to understand it, it's not intuitive and a lot of people aren't going to understand it. So back to something called the guidelines. And the guidelines are generated by groups of health professionals, often in a specialty, whether it's your specialty, like rheumatology or cardiology or gastroenterology, fill in the blank. There are guidelines. What physicians should do for this condition And one that we have, I apologize, kind of beaten into the ground is statins because 
In this country, about 50 million Americans are currently taking statins to lower their LDL cholesterol. I don't think most physicians or patients have any clue how much benefit they will get, either in the number needed to treat, if it's for primary prevention, and you can share with our listeners what that means versus secondary prevention. But it's my recollection, having looked at the data recently, that if you were to take a statin for five years or longer, that you might gain about two or three weeks of extra life. And when people hear that, they go, what are you talking about? This is supposed to prevent a heart attack. So help us understand the guidelines, statins as a metaphor for many other meds. Okay, so I should first tell you that I'm, I'm not a statin or lipid lowering expert. I can tell you that many guidelines, um, people who get on guidelines uh, have direct links to the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, I can tell you that we, are, we have developed living guidelines for rheumatology in Australia where we don't allow any conflicts of interest of the panel members and we update the evidence in real time so that it's available at the point of care and it includes all the latest evidence. So another problem with guidelines is that they're done one point in time and then they might be updated five years later. Putting that aside, um, the number needed to treat it is basically what it says, the number that would be needed to treat to prevent a, an event or to prevent something. The problem is that there are, that people can use statistics to befuddle um, the public and doctors um, by talking about absolute risk reductions and relative risk reductions. But the way that you describe the benefit is how we should be explaining the benefit. And I can do that with think like pharmacological drugs to prevent fractures. Uh, if you go into the evidence, the absolute risk reduction is very small. And so you have to tell patients that, yes, you take this drug for a long time and it might reduce your fracture risk by a small percentage. Uh, and probably what's more important is that you don't fall over and you do a lot of other you know, lifestyle things. And again, we won't ever know whether you benefit because we can't look forward with our crystal ball. So, so I think we have to understand the limitations of those sorts of predictions and, and explain it to patients in ways they understand because some patients will still want to go on the drug, but other patients will not. Well, let's dig a little deeper, Terry. Osteoporosis, it affects a lot of older women. It does, and actually some older men as well, John. And so the real question is, well, how good are these various drugs? There are a lot of them at preventing those fractures you're talking about, because that's really what people want to do. They, they don't want a hip fracture because that can end their life precipitously. So you're suggesting that maybe looking over the house and avoiding falls might be even more effective? Well, I, th I think in some people, th th I mean, you have to look at the risk factors and um, drugs increase bone density, but that's not the primary reason why people fracture, perhaps. It's because they have poor balance, they're frail, they fall over, uh, and they have other reasons for having um, brittle bones and they're elderly. We're, we are just looking at the, the um, you know, there's no question that they reduce fractures in people who've had fractures. Um, they can reduce hip fractures, they can reduce vertebral and other fractures. I think the jury is out for people who have thin bones. And I think the jury is also out for men. And we're just completing a Cochrane review, looking at the value of all of these drugs in men with osteoporosis, both primary prevention, which means stopping a fra fracture in people who haven't yet had a fracture, and secondary prevention, which is stopping a further fracture in someone who's had a fracture. And we know in men that the physiology of, of their bones and, and their way that they fracture is a little bit different. And I, while I can't definitively tell you the conclusions now, overall, it, it, it might be that we're going to conclude pretty much what 
the way that you said that many Cochrane reviews conclude in that there's low certainty evidence that these drugs may or may not work uh, and um, and m more research is needed. And again, you know, there are very few studies in men. Uh, men do get osteoporosis uh, and often the studies have excluded men or they're not or there are small numbers of men and the data is not presented separately. So that's a study crying out for a placebo-controlled trial. Well, I think that actually brings up uh, another place where we have an opportunity for medicine to n not be as evidence-based as it might be. There's a, a tendency to sort of categorize people, label them ahead of time, and then either overdiagnose them or underdiagnose them. So, for example, women might be underdiagnosed with heart disease because we think of heart disease as affecting men, whereas men might be underdiagnosed with osteoporosis or with migraine, because we think of migraines as primarily affecting women. Can you talk just briefly, please, about the diagnosis problem? Okay, so, so a diagnosis is really defined as you give someone a label for their problem, and we assume that that label will benefit them. So it'll either benefit them because they'll get the right treatment and they'll it'll have benefits, uh, or it'll label them and give you some useful information about what their likely outcome is. There is both problems with misdiagnosis, so that's a wrong diagnosis. There are problems with underdiagnosis, as, as you said, um, but where my research is mainly is on what's called overdiagnosis. And overdiagnosis is a diagnosis that is correct, so it is still correct, um, but making that diagnosis will not benefit the patient in their lifetime. So you're, you're giving them a diagnosis, you're possibly giving them treatment, and it will not benefit them. And in fact, in many instances, it might cause harm. And a, a classic example was the thyroid cancer epidemic in South Korea, where people were being diagnosed. So the rate of diagnosis was going up, but the rate of dying from thyroid cancer was still very low and stayed low, did not change. And what happened in that country was that they suddenly decided they were going to screen for thyroid cancer. And they ended up picking up lots of cancers, so they were a true diagnosis, but the type of cancer was basically harmless or benign. It would never cause any harm in the whole lifetime of the patient. But because it was an overdiagnosis, those patients were treated. They had their thyroids removed. They have a big scar across their neck. They have to take lifelong thyroid medication and often had complications like a horse boy. Uh, and so that, that was identified as a problem and, and the, that policy was reversed and the, the um, incidence went down again to what it was before. So it was really a pseudo-epidemic. You're listening to Dr. Rochelle Bookbinder, head of the Musculoskeletal Health and Wiser Healthcare Units at Monash University School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine. Dr. Bookbinder works with the Cochrane Collaboration and participates in the Clinical Trials Network Center of Research Excellence. Her book, co-authored with Dr. Ian Harris, is Hypocrisy, How Doctors Are Betraying Their Oath. Dr. Bookbinder spoke to us from her office in Melbourne, Australia. We recorded this interview from our home studio. It's time for a short break. After that, we'll find out what happens when doctors treat numbers instead of patients. Sometimes an idealized number like 120 over 80 for blood pressure isn't right for every person. Focusing on numbers can result in expanding categories like pre-hypertension or pre-diabetes. Professor Bookbinder offers her insights on the close relationship between the pharmaceutical industry and the medical profession. Are there questions that patients and their families can ask to reduce unnecessary treatments that might not benefit them?
You're listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon. This podcast is brought to you in part by The People's Pharmacy Urea Skin Relief. You know, when temperatures drop, the heat comes on. Unfortunately, that means lower humidity and drier skin. How can you keep your skin comfortable and healthy this fall and winter? Well, we are pleased to announce the People's Pharmacy Urea Skin Relief. It has 20% urea, which improves the skin barrier function and helps with deep moisturizing. This intensive skin therapy is available in either handy 2-ounce or economical 6-ounce tubes, but it's only available on the peoplespharmacy.com website. As a People's Pharmacy podcast listener, you can get 20% off your purchase of Urea Skin Relief from now through the end of the year. Just enter SKIN20 as your discount code when you check out from the store at peoplespharmacy.com. Remember, SKIN S-K-I-N-20, for your discount. Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy. I'm Terry Graydon. And I'm Joe Graydon. The People's Pharmacy is made possible in part by Cocovia Dietary Supplements. Cocovia's biggest sale of the year is Black Friday and Cyber Monday. You could promote your heart and brain health by incorporating cocoflavanols into your daily routine for optimal cardiovascular and cognitive support. More information about savings and products at cocovia.com. The CDC estimates that nearly half of all American adults have hypertension. Another 60 million have pre-hypertension. How critical is it to get everyone to the ideal goal of 120 over 80, or perhaps even lower? Is there any harm in over-medicating people? Could blood pressure medications have unwelcome or dangerous side effects? The pharmaceutical industry is one of the most powerful lobbying organizations in the country. It staunchly defends the right to advertise medicines on television. Do such commercials advance public health? What questions should patients and their families be asking before they accept a prescription or a referral for surgery? How can we determine which interventions offer benefit and which might be unnecessary or counterproductive? Should we hold health professionals accountable? We're talking with Dr. Rochelle Bookbinder head of the Musculoskeletal Health and Wiser Healthcare Units at Monash University School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine in Melbourne, Australia. Professor Bookbinder holds the position of Senior Principal Research Fellow with Australia's National Health and Medical Research Council and is Coordinating Editor of the Cochrane Collaboration's Musculoskeletal Back and Neck Division. She's also chair of the NHMRC Australia and New Zealand Musculoskeletal Clinical Trials Network Center of Research Excellence. Her book, co-authored with Dr. Ian Harris, is Hypocrisy, How Doctors Are Betraying Their Oath. Dr. Bookbinder, you've written about the normalization heuristic, aside from the fact that heuristic is kind of a fancy word. I wonder if you can tell us why treating numbers instead of treating patients is a problem. <laughs> well, there are, there are many problems with that. One is that the numbers may not accurately reflect the patient, uh, and we, we need to treat the patient in front of us. And that involves a combination of, firstly, common sense, uh, the patient preferences and values, uh, and then the evidence for benefit over, over harm. And often, um, again, as I said before, doctors overestimate the benefits and underestimate the harms. Well, I'd like to share a story about my mom. She was probably in her, I'd say her 80s, don't you think, Terry? And late 80s. Late 80s. And, and her blood pressure was going up. And it was getting up to 140 over 90, a little higher. And her doctor was pushing 
a couple of different blood pressure medications and her kidneys started to react badly. And so she was sent to a kidney specialist internist and he came out and he said, Helen, I could get you down to 120 over 80, but you're going to feel bad. You're going to feel dizzy and you could fall. And if you fall, you could have a fracture and that could lead to all kinds of problems. If we leave your blood pressure a little higher, maybe 130 over 85 or 90, you'll probably feel better, but you might die of a stroke. So how would you like to proceed? And my mom said, you know, I think I'll feel better if my blood pressure's a little higher. And if a stroke takes me out, that's okay. I can live with that. And she lived to 93 and uh, ultimately died of a medical mistake, not of a stroke. So help us understand this balance when it comes to things like high blood pressure and the normalization of a 80 or 90 year old woman trying to get her blood pressure down below 120 over 80. Yeah. So the first thing to say is that doctors want to do things to help their patients. So they're coming from a good place, but what happens is that the unintended consequences or harm are not well recognized. And around the world, um, people have been, for good intentions, widening disease definition, definitions. And so one way of doing that is lowering the threshold for what is high blood pressure. Another one is um, uh, lowering the threshold, for example, uh, of what make a pregnant woman have diabetes or not. So that's been widened by 20%. And what what people haven't done is decide whether that actually benefits the patients. And for gestational diabetes, it meant that another 20% of women or so were diagnosed with gestational diabetes, but the trials showed that they that did not benefit the mother or the baby and in fact led to a lot of unintended consequences like lots of more drugs and, and, and harms like anxiety. And I think the same thing applies with a blood pressure lowering medication. Uh, and again, the unintended consequences of the harms of doing that. And it also raises another issue about medicalizing normal. Uh, and so as we get older, you know, we, we've now make, we made menopause a medical illness. We've made aging a medical illness. We've made dying a medical illness. Uh, and then we, we, we medicalized what's really normal parts of life. So it's a matter of the society, I guess, to decide how much we want to medicalize normal, but we need to stop, you know, my, the other thing is that with that example of blood pressure is that the, it, we've made the risk factor a disease and high blood pressure is the risk factor for strokes and heart attacks. It's not the disease itself. So I think we have to just be really careful about unintended consequences of, of changing thresholds and definitions of disease. Well, in fact, part of what we've been doing, as you talked about uh, widening the definition so we include more people, we've also created sort of new categories. So we have pre-hypertension and we have pre-diabetes. And how much treatment do people really need in these pre-categories uh, is, is a question that may not have been adequately examined with really strong evidence. What can you tell us about that? So again, it comes from a good intentions. It comes from a good place. Uh, and originally, as my understand it, the idea was to identify people at risk of all of these things to improve their lifestyle. So to, you know, reduce their salt, increase their exercise, weight loss. But it's really been taken over by how many more people can we sell drugs to, I think. And so it's fine to think about these things, but the problem is when they're commercialized and and people make profit from the pre-diagnosis. I think that is a, a big problem. But I think it's fine to say that you're risk, at risk of something and these are the things that you can do as long as we don't medicalize it. One of the things that has uh, worried us, especially in the last several decades, is this 
what I would call um, incestuous relationship between the pharmaceutical industry and the medical industry as a whole. That also includes devices and doctors who are the targets of their drugs. I mean, drugs are ultimately going to be taken by patients, but it's the doctors who are the gatekeepers and who recommend them. I don't know if we can change it, but I'd be curious about your perspective on this very close relationship between the industry and the profession that you practice. So I, firstly, I should say that the pharmaceutical industry have given us many breakthrough, wonderful drugs that have helped patients. So that's the first thing. And even in my field of rheumatology, we have had breakthrough drugs that have completely changed the course of disease for things like rheumatoid arthritis. So we have to acknowledge that. But the fact that there is such a, and and there are many doctors who work at the research level to actually try and get better drugs for patients. And my husband is an oncologist and he works with drug companies in research to test things. But the problem is when the pharmaceutical companies use their marketing strategies to increase their market share of drugs. And I think that the fact that doctors can get directly paid, uh, and this isn't acknowledged to the patients, it's not made clear, um, I think that's where there is a problem. And again, the problem is this fee for service. So, you know, if we weren't, if we, we didn't have any vested interests, then perhaps medicine would be practiced um, in a better fashion, but that's something I, I can't answer. But there's clear evidence now that, you know, doctors that receive money from industry um, for and are not doing that that, was, that primary research, um, it does influence their prescribing patterns. Uh, and I think that that is a huge problem. Um, and we know in Australia, for example, recently the figures are that 61% of rheumatologists in Australia have received industry funding. Um, and I think that is a problem because patients don't know that. It, it's quite similar in the United States. It might even be uh, worse. You can look up on, Joe, is it the um, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid um, website that talks about which doctors have received which funds? There is a website in the U.S. that the government uh, is involved with that allows patients to find out how much their physician is receiving from the pharmaceutical or medical device industry. And it, and it sometimes comes as quite a shock to people to discover, oh yeah, my doctor got $30,000 last year for talking to other doctors as a, for example. Well, well, we've talked about the, the difficulties with doctors uh, wanting to treat the numbers. And though it comes from a good place, it's not always the best practice. We've talked about um, doctors using their confirmation bias. And um, what, what else can they do? You've written about the Choosing Wisely campaign, which, as I understand it, is, the, is a U.S. campaign. Do you have something similar in Australia? Yeah, so it, it's Choosing Wisely is in many countries now, including Australia, uh, although the evidence that it's made dramatic changes is we're still waiting to see that. But I think, again, the idea is really good, and it's for doctors in their own specialty or among what they do is to identify the five things that they do um, that is not science-based. So it's recognizing, for example, in my field um, that we do too many um, imaging for people with acute back pain. Um, We know that most people don't need imaging. And so we try, we, our mission is to try and stop that. Uh, It's about knee arthroscopy that we've talked about. Um, It's about you know, ordering blood tests that that are not warranted, uh, and but it, the basic thing is that it's physician led, and it's physicians identifying the things that they should stop doing. Doctor Bookbinder, I would be so grateful if you could run down some of the questions that patients and their families can begin to ask of their physician. Here we also have physician associates and we have nurse practitioners. So what kinds of questions can can people ask of their health professionals 
to reduce unnecessary fill in the blank procedures, pharmaceuticals, other kinds of involvements that might not benefit them? And how do they hold their health professionals' feet to the fire, as we like to say in the U.S., to make sure that they're getting answers that make sense and are science-based? Yes. So I, I think it also applies to tests. And so many people are getting tests and think it's a good thing, and they don't understand that there are downstream harms from that as well. So I think for any recommendation that the doctor makes, for any care they want to deliver, a patient should and their family should ask, well, what are the benefits of doing that? Can you give me some, some data about that? What are the potential harms? What are my alternatives? What are other things that I can do? Um, and what are, the, what are the potential outcomes of that? What would happen if I did nothing? Uh, and should I get a second opinion? And I think getting a second opinion, um, we shouldn't be afraid of that as doctors. And I think that is a good thing. Um, but I think they should, if it's something like a procedure or surgery, they should ask, well, what are, what, what are the outcomes in your hands? Can you tell me how many successful operations you've had and what your complications are? And I think making all of this transparent is so important. And but on the other hand, I think it's really hard to put the onus on the patient. And, you know, the patient comes with a problem, they're really worried, that they're not in the headspace to sort of have an open discussion. So I think there are things that doctors can do too. They can put up signs in their waiting room. You know, we are uh, evidence-based practice, ask us questions, you know, ask us questions that, that worry you. Um, I think it's really a, important that doctors do something as well and and it doctors that have given um the public the expectation that we can fix everything and so we really need to be honest and say that you know the best thing might be to do nothing in this case and it's increasingly difficult for doctors to do nothing and it's increasingly difficult to convince patients to do nothing so you know i think we all have to work together uh it's not you know it shouldn't just be put on the patient it needs to come from the doctors I think we have to um, promote science literacy amongst our, our people right from school uh, and you know we do science but we should be doing health literacy as well and we should get getting young people used to asking questions and then we will have better doctors and and better um, you know more informed patients as well that sounds like good advice Dr. Rochelle Bookbinder Thank you so much for talking with us on The People's Pharmacy today. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to Professor Rochelle Bookbinder, Investigator Fellow of the National Health and Medical Research Council of Australia. Dr. Bookbinder is head of the Musculoskeletal Health and Wiser Healthcare Units at the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine of Monash University. She's also the Monash Warwick Honorary Professor of the Clinical Trials Unit at Warwick Medical School of Warwick University in the UK. Dr. Bookbinder is Coordinating Editor of the Cochrane Collaboration Musculoskeletal Back and Neck Division and Chair of the NHMRC Australia and New Zealand Musculoskeletal Clinical Trials Network Center of Research Excellence. Her book, co-authored with Dr. Ian Harris, is Hypocrisy, How Doctors Are Betraying Their Oath. Lynn Siegel produced today's show. Al Wadarski engineered. Dave Graydon edits our interviews. B.J. Lederman composed our theme music. This show is a co-production of North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC with the People's Pharmacy. The People's Pharmacy is made possible in part by Coco Via Dietary Supplements. Coco Via's biggest sale of the year is Black Friday and Cyber Monday. You could promote your heart and brain health by incorporating Coco Flavanols into your daily routine for optimal cardiovascular and cognitive support. More information at CocoVia.com. Today's show is number 1,409. You can find it online at peoplespharmacy.com.
That's where you can share your comments about today's interview. You could also reach us through email, radio at peoplespharmacy.com. Our interviews are available through your favorite podcast provider, including YouTube Music. You'll find the podcast on our website on Monday morning. At peoplespharmacy.com, you could sign up for our free online newsletter and get the latest news about important health stories. When you subscribe, you get regular access to information about our weekly podcast so you can find out ahead of time what topics we're covering. In Durham, North Carolina, I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. Thanks for listening. Please join us again next week. Thank you for listening to the People's Pharmacy Podcast. It's an honor and a pleasure to bring you our award-winning program week in and week out. But producing and distributing this show as a free podcast takes time and costs money. If you like what we do and you'd like to help us continue to produce high-quality, independent healthcare journalism, please consider chipping in. All you have to do is go to peoplespharmacy.com slash donate. Whether it's just one time or a monthly donation, you can be part of the team that makes this show possible. Thank you for your continued loyalty and support. We couldn't make our show without you.